As we prepare ourselves to come to the table of remembrance through cup and bread, in preparation for a true appreciation of the gift that God has given, I want you to hear a word from the Lord that finds us rooting in the book of 2 Corinthians in the New Testament. If you're able to journey with me into the fifth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians, there is a passage of scripture I want to read out of the New King James Version of the Bible that will prayerfully bless you, beginning in verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it is our custom to kindly ask those who are physically able to stand with us as we reverence the reading of God's word from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 14. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to ask your prayers as we talk, teach, and preach this morning. From the subject, the idea, the theme behind enemy lines. Behind enemy lines. On June the 2nd, 1995, United States Air Force Captain Scott O'Grady, while piloting an F 16 over Bosnian no fly zone, was shot down by hostile Serb forces. His plane crashed in hostile enemy territory. And for six days, Captain O'Grady lived his life on the run, seeking only to escape and evade enemy capture. In his biography, entitled Return with Honor, he details and describes and chronicled what it was like to live life for six days behind enemy lines. He tells of the fear of knowing that hostile forces were trying to capture him. And if captured, he would be tortured and publicly executed. He spoke of the despair of wandering around in territory that he knew not, not knowing which direction to go and where to flee for safety. He describes the depression of waking up every day and the only agenda on his day was to make it to sunset. He describes the hopelessness of knowing that the United States could not openly invade Bosnia to save one man. And as he spoke about the fear and the despair, the depression, the hopelessness, Dr. Gunny came to the conclusion and he wrote, I felt like I was a dead man walking. I was waiting for death to come and find me. 
The only hope for Captain O'Grady came when the captain of the USS Kearsarge, who was also a friend of Scott O'Grady's, launched a special Marine unit that specialized in operations called TRAP, tactical recovery of aircraft and personnel. These Marines had been trained to go behind enemy lines and search and rescue. They put on the uniform of their enemy. They were dropped down into hostile territory. They slipped behind enemy lines. They searched for Captain Scott O'Grady and when they found him, they rescued him and delivered him from hostile territory back to the protective custody of the United States of America. These Marines were trained to go behind enemy lines and rescue somebody who was utterly incapable of saving themselves. If you understand Scott O'Grady's story, then you're well able to understand the doctrine of the Apostle Paul. Because Paul would let you know that what happened to Scott O'Grady was not unique. But in actuality, it is the salvation story of humanity. It is our story of how the Lord has dealt with us. Because the truth be told on a Sunday morning, everybody in here has landed in enemy territory. Everybody in the sanctuary on Sunday, including that brother in your seat, knows what it's like to stand on the wrong side of the line that divides sin and righteousness. I know your Bible is big and you got your Baptist on today. I know that you look like you mighty saved and you love Jesus and you walk right with God. But if the truth be told, all of us have spent more than enough time in hostile enemy sinful territory outside of the will of God. If your neighbor hadn't said amen, just nudge him real quick and say, he's talking to you. Bible teaches us that all of us have been like sheep and we've wandered and gone astray. Romans 3.23 declares that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I know you've got some neighbors that, that translate that differently and say y'all have sinned. But the true translation is that all have sinned. So Isaiah declares in chapter 64, verse 6, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Even at your sanctified Sunday best, you still cross the line into enemy territory. With your Bible quoting, hymn singing, prayer lifting up self, acting like you're righteous. You even bow your head when you pray, but you still wind up in places that are displeasing to the Lord. Everybody in here has been behind enemy lines. And in that place, we experience what the theologian Paul Tillich calls existential estrangement. That in the place of sin, we are exiled from God's holiness. We are at enmity with his goodness. We are estranged from his presence. We are excluded from his benefits. We are eliminated from his abundance. We are evicted from his righteousness and we experience the same feelings of Scott O'Grady depression of a life that's going nowhere despair over no purpose for which we wake up in the morning a fear knowing that at some moment your sin will catch up with you and 
the hopelessness of realizing that you can't save yourself. Beloved, when you live in a sinful state and in a place outside of the will of God, you are nothing other than a dead woman and a dead man walking, waiting on death to come and claim you. Now, you don't feel it at first because sin is mighty deceptive. Sin feels good in the beginning. Sin tickles your fancy in chapter one. Sin looks mighty good on the menu until you order it and find out it always costs you more than was advertised. Can I preach right here? Um, you, you know what sin is like? Sin is, is kind of like that commercial for prescription drugs you see. It starts off telling you all the good things it can do. Marley, it could be a commercial for a drug for chronic dandruff. And it promises you that when you use this drug, no more dandruff, no more itch, no more flakes on your shoulder. But if you keep listening, it then tells you some possible side effects. Migraine headaches, blurred vision, fever, vomiting and nausea, irritable bowel syndrome. And once you hear the side effects, you declare that the drug really can't be worth it if it's going to do all of this to me. That's what sin does. It tells you it'll make you feel good. It tells you it'll relieve some of the stress in your life. It makes you believe that it gives you what you want, but hold on for the side effects. Loss of joy, sleepless nights, something that blocks your prayer to God, something that is an embarrassment to your witness, something that's a stain against your family, something that'll cost you your job, something that'll cost you your respect of your co-workers. And the Bible says that the wages of sin, that sin pays you, is eternal death. And when you live in that place of sin, you come to the realization of Scott O'Grady. You can't save yourself. You can't outrun your faults and failures. You can't cover up your shortcomings. You can't medicate your issues. You can't intoxicate your problems. There are no 12 steps out of sin. You can't work hard enough to hide from them. You can't sleep with enough people to ignore them. You can't earn enough money to pay for them. You can't work enough overtime to avoid them. At the end of the day, you've got to deal with sin because sin will deal with you. And it is the Apostle Paul who realizes he can't deal with his own sin. So when he puts a pen to paper and he writes Romans chapter 7, this is what he says. Oh, wretched man that I am. I'm wretched, I'm wretched, I'm unrighteous because every time I try to do right, I wind up doing wrong. Somebody ought to wink a man right there. Every time I say I ain't going to do something, I wind up doing it again. Have you ever been there? Have you ever found yourself in a mess 
and your prayer went a little something like this, uh, Lord, um, I need you to get me out of this. And Lord, if you get me out of this, I will never, ever, ever, ever do it again. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Only to come back to the altar next week. Uh, now, Lord, I know I said <laughs> that I'd never do this again. Paul understands you can't deliver yourself from sin, even with a convicted mind, even with a guilty conscience, even with a penalty that you have to pay, you still wind up in sin. So he asked the question, who can deliver me? Who can get me out of this? Who can bring me out of the mess I'm in? And he says the bad news is that you can't deal with your own sin. You can't save yourself from enemy territory. But here's the good news. There's one man who's been trained to go behind enemy lines to seek and to search and to save and to rescue we who have found ourselves in sinful territory. There is a man who's not ashamed to put on the enemy's clothes. There is a savior who's not afraid of enemy territory, who descended into sin and into the depth of hell to deliver us. And his name is Jesus. That Christ has come behind enemy lines and put on the uniform of humanity to seek and to save those who are lost. Let me give you a side order of scripture. Paul says in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and came in the form of a bondservant and in the likeness of humanity and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross so that God hath highly exalted him wish I had a Bible reader and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father can't nobody save me like Jesus that, that he has come to save us that he descended from heaven, slipped behind enemy lines, nailed himself to a cross, descended into the depth of hell, and rose on the third day that I might be saved. And God demonstrates his love towards us in that we were sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for me. Now, now, let me tell you why I'm a Christian. Now, I don't know how you feel about other rural religions. I, I'm not here to judge that. But the reason I'm a Christian is because Christ died for me. Huh. Dr. Gunn, a whole lot of folk died, but they ain't died for you. Moses died, but he didn't die for you. David died, but he didn't die for you. Peter died, but he didn't die for you. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad died, but he didn't die for you. 
Confucius died, but he didn't die for you. Buddha died, but he didn't die for you. There's only one man who descended to earth and yielded his life for my sin and my salvation that in his name I might be saved. Somebody say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. That, that, that word saved that Paul uses is this Greek term, soteria. S-O-T-E-R-I-A. And soteria literally has three components. I want you to understand what it means to be saved. Soteria has three definitions. It means, number one, to be delivered out of. It means, number two, to be preserved for. And it means, number three, to be protected from. My salvation means I am delivered out of. I am preserved for. And I am protected from. Boy, I'm about to shout myself. My salvation means that he's delivered me out of. He's preserved me for. And he's protected me from. Let's start at the beginning. He has delivered me out of some stuff. He's pulled me out of some mess. He's gotten me out of some trouble. To be delivered out of means that the Lord has delivered me out of sin. You know the best way to understand this? I need to take you back maybe about eight years ago. I just moved to Alexandria and I had the boys with me and I took them down to the pool at one of the uh, local rec centers. So we're at the pool and the boys are playing in the water and the time gets away from us and I realize I've got to make a business call. The problem is that there's no good signal in the pool. The boys are in the water. I have to make the call. Now, I don't want to leave them in the pool while I go make the call, but Dash, I know if I get them out the pool, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> so, I'm trying to figure out what to do, and it is then that I met a member of Alpha Street Baptist Church, because y'all are <laughs> everywhere. I brother, met a brother by the name of Maurice Terrell. We call him Mo. Mo drives the buses to this day. Good, faithful brother. Mo was at the pool. He knew I had to make a call. He said, Pastor, don't worry. Go make the call. I'll watch the kids. I felt pretty good. I got somebody who's going to watch them. And as I'm walking out to make a call, it dawned on me, that ain't enough. I'm glad that you can watch them. But I need something else. So I go back to Mo. I say, if something happens, he said, Rem, don't worry. If something happens, not only will I watch them, I'll jump in the pool with them. So I'm feeling pretty good now. I got somebody watching them who will jump in the pool with them. I'm on my way out, and it dawns on me, that ain't enough. I'm glad you can watch them. I'm glad you're willing to jump in with them. But I forgot to ask a critical question. Can you swim? I don't just need you to watch them. I don't just need you to jump in with them. I need to know that you can pull them out and get them to safety when they're drowning. Let me tell you about our God. He watches us. He comes to us. But the good news is that he also delivers us. I'm so glad that he watches me. I'm so glad that he comes to me. But my soul gets happy when I know he will deliver me. Somebody holler, I'm saved. He's pulled me out of sin. But the second definition is that I'm preserved. So watch this, if deliverance is him pulling me out of sin, preservation, here's the shout, 
is him pulling sin out of me. Ooh, 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 ooh-wee. Not only does he pull me out of sin, but the Lord is able to pull some sin out of me. Now, now, this, this amen ain't for everybody. Some of y'all ain't been changed. And if you ain't been changed, you have divine permission to be quiet right around here. I'm looking for a few witnesses that can testify that when I met the Lord, the Lord changed some desires in my heart. The Lord took a taste out of my mouth. The Lord broke a bad habit I had. Do I have any changed saints who know the Lord will take it out of you? He, he not only pulled me out of sin, he pulled some sin out of me. Some stuff I used to like, I don't like no more. Some things I used to do, I don't want to do no more. Some folk I used to run with, you get the point. He delivers me out of, he preserves me for, and he protects me from. Not only will the Lord pull me out of sin and pull sin out of me, but the Lord will keep me from going back to some of the stuff I want to get back in. Now, now, this isn't for everybody. Because there's some people in the sanctuary who want you to believe that since they gave their life to the Lord, And since they come to church every now and then, and since they read their Bible once in a while, and since they even sing the hymns, that they are sanctified and sold out, that they have no desire for anything other than Jesus. I'm not preaching to the liars. I'm looking for the be real saints who can acknowledge I love Jesus, but I slip and stumble every now and then. I've got a Bible, (laughs) but I need some help every now and then. That I'm not as holy as I want to be. That every now and then, I feel like cussing somebody out. Every now and then, I feel like doing something I ain't got no business doing. Are there any real saints in the house? But here's the good news of salvation. The Lord has a way of keeping you from what you ain't got no business doing. Um, um, The Lord, the Lord has a way of running interference on your premeditated sin. Have, have, Have you ever had a good sin set up in your mind. And, and the Lord ran some interference on it. I mean, you, you ever had it in your mind what you was about to do? And, and the Lord just messed that plan up. A car wouldn't start. He didn't answer the phone when you called. (laughs) Liquor store was closed before you got there. (laughs) You was about to get up and arthritis set you right back down. (laughs) The Lord has a way of running interference to keep you from what a child of God should not be in. Uh, Let me go on and close. Let me, I, I found this out in my first church when I was pastoring. Um, It was Easter Sunday, and it had rained, Dr. Faye, all night long before Easter. And on Easter Sunday morning, I was sitting in the office watching the saints pull up and park and walk into church. In case you don't know this, on Easter Sunday, Baptists dress to impress. Uh, they, They put it on on Easter. I'm watching the saints park. Car pulls up, 
Daddy gets out the car, and Daddy is clean. Daddy got on a white suit, a pink shirt, a white tie, and some white and pink matching alligator shoes. Daddy was clean. Daddy opened up the side door, and out come Mama. And Mama ain't to be outdone. Mama got on a white suit with a pink blouse, a white hat, and some bad pink pumps. They are coordinated. <laughs> but it ain't done. They open up the back door and out hop little man. And little man got on a white suit, a pink shirt, and some white Air Force One with pink laces in them. I'm telling y'all, they were coordinated. They started walking through the parking lot to come to church. And all of a sudden, from nowhere, a puddle in the back of the parking lot must have called little man's name. He turned and saw the puddle and something inside of him said, go get in that puddle. And he starts running to the puddle. I'm banging on the window. <laughs> hey, he about to go make a mess. He's running to the puddle. All of a sudden, his daddy turns and sees him. And his daddy starts running after him. The boy is running to the puddle. His daddy's running after him. The boy gets within a few feet. He jumps up getting ready to make a splash. And as soon as he jumped, his daddy reached out and grabbed him by the collar and snatched him back and said, no, you don't. Not today. I wish I had a truthful saint who knows you are on your way to go jump into something you had no business being in. But our God had a way of reaching down and snatching you so that you could holler, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Is there anybody here that's glad you're saved, glad you've been redeemed, glad you've been forgiven, glad you've been washed, glad you've been brought out, I'm saved. Save! Oh, Y'all sit down, I'm done, I'm done. Listen, I am suspect of saints that need something more than salvation to rejoice in. When I know what God has brought me out of, when I remember what the Lord has taken out of me, when I remember how the Lord has kept me from some stuff, I can be broke and still praise him. I can be sick and still give him glory. I can be alone and know that I've got a real reason to rejoice because my name is written in heaven. Beloved, it is a sad thing to have something precious and you not know how valuable it is. It's a sad thing to have something precious and not know who paid for it. Our salvation is the most precious gift God has given us. And it came at the cost of the life of Jesus Christ. That's why we come to this table every month. That you would not take for granted what Christ did for you. If you've got any old school church in you, Although the table is covered, you know the words that are inscribed on the front. This do in remembrance of me. The coming to this table is an act of remembrance of what Christ did for us and who we are in him.